I've been watching a lot of the Saints Unscripted YouTube channel lately. A few videos really stuck out to me. For those of you who don't know, it's a YouTube channel run by a bunch of Mormons. I don't think it's an official church YouTube channel or anything, but they talk a lot about church issues and beliefs. They generally seem to be pretty moderate, chill people. They just believe crazy stuff. So let's take a quick look at a video they made called, Will My Feelings Tell Me If The Book of Mormon Is True? Let's get into it. Okay, before we get into the clips, I just want to explain something real quick. I always upload my videos a day before they officially release, and the reason for that is twofold. One, I upload them so patrons and personal friends can get a sneak peek. And two, I do it so I have the opportunity to request manual review if they decide to demonetize. Now, demonetization hasn't really been a problem for me up until now. They demonetized every video I ever put out when they first started on this demonetization tirade. No big deal. I requested manual review, and most of them were cleared. Not all, but a good portion. They almost never demonetized from then on. Every now and then they would. Like my video on the Westboro Baptist Church got demonetized basically immediately because of all the choice language I had in there. Fine, I understand. Don't like it, but whatever. But then they demonetized my video on Heaven's Gate the other day, and they've demonetized every other video after that. It wouldn't be a big thing if they just demonetize them as soon as I upload and I can request manual review, but instead they wait until the hour it releases to demonetize. I don't understand why they do that. Why wait until release hour? I lose hundreds of dollars. I need that shit to live off of. What are you doing, YouTube? If you're gonna demonetize, then just fucking do it so I can request manual review. And if you're gonna keep it demonetized, I would love it if you gave me a reason. What word did I use that you didn't like? I consider myself a psychology channel. Should I start making cat videos instead? If you guys want to support my work, you can do it on Teespring or Patreon. I just put some Mormon shirts and stickers and stuff on my Teespring, and it's actually really helpful when you guys shop at my store, so consider doing that. Or you can go to Patreon and get early access to my videos. Okay, I don't usually put stuff in my videos about all that, but I felt like it was important because I've lost a lot of money this month that I intended to use for rent. Now let's get into the Mormon video. When people first learn about the Book of Mormon, our missionaries will generally ask them to do three things. Read it, think about it, and ask God with real intent if it is what it claims to be. The promise is that at some point and in some way, God will answer that prayer through the Holy Ghost. That should make sense to any Christian. We believe God answers prayers. Now, how will the Holy Ghost answer that prayer? Well, it could be in a variety of different ways, but oftentimes answers from the Spirit come in association with the fruits of the Spirit, or feelings of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, etc. Some people understandably have a big problem with that because feelings shouldn't be a valid indicator of truth, right? I mean, pizza makes me feel joy, but that's probably not from the Spirit. So what he's saying here is that we should ask God to answer our prayers and then keep a lookout for the answer, right? Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the psychology behind that. In psychology, we have something called cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's a common technique used to treat people with certain conditions, like depression, for example. The idea behind it is that people have cognitive distortions, kind of like fallacies. It's thinking that isn't grounded in reality, for lack of a better term. Here are a few of them. Filtering. This happens when somebody focuses on the bad parts of a situation and ignores the good parts. Or they'll focus in on a single bad thing and ignore the rest. For example, at the end of the day, you feel depressed because you said something stupid to somebody and you can't get it out of your head. Then, after that, you tripped on your way from the kitchen and dropped your plate of food. That's enough to ruin somebody's day. But you're ignoring the fact that you, say, got a promotion at work. Or that your girlfriend said she wants to move in with you. Or any number of other positive things. If you're looking for something negative, then you'll find it. If you're looking for something positive, then you'll find it. Here's another, polarized or black and white thinking. It's an all or nothing kind of mindset. People with black and white thinking see things in extremes, and a lot of the time it leads to placing people into in-groups and out-groups. Another is personalization. This is where people feel like everything that happens or everything others say or do is directed at them. This one is particularly important for what we're talking about here with the video. Take a look at the famous skeptic's prayer, quote unquote. It says something like, God, I wanna believe in you, so if you're real, then reveal 
reveal yourself to me and I will accept Jesus. And you're supposed to say it with sincerity. That's basically what they're talking about in this video. Except they aren't talking generally. They're talking specifically for Mormons. My big problem with that is mainly the fact that you're priming your brain to expect a result. You're creating conditions in which you expect to see some kind of a sign. It's a result of those cognitive distortions I mentioned a minute ago. Personalization, where you think everything that happens is directed at you. Filtering, where you ignore the misses and remember the hits. And polarized thinking, where it absolutely must be God sending a sign. There's no other explanation. Saying that prayer is priming your brain for all of that stuff. It's a method of mind control. It's a method of manipulation. The one thing that makes me suspicious of the whole process is the fact that people from all different denominations and religions do the exact same thing and somehow God reveals to all of them that they're correct. Muslims try it and God reveals to them that Islam is correct. Hindus try it and their gods reveal that they're correct. Mormons do it and God reveals that Joseph Smith was the true prophet. Jehovah's Witnesses do it and God reveals that the governing body really does have the truth. That is the exact result we'd expect to see if none of them were true and you were just brainwashing yourself. If God were real, then what we'd expect to see is people doing that with a single group and coming to the conclusion that they had the truth, but seeing it fail when people tried it with other groups. Now, you can make up explanations for why it works for all of those groups all you want. Maybe there is a God and he's revealing that all these religions are right. Setting aside the fact that it looks exactly as it would if you were just brainwashing yourself, and setting aside the fact that you can do this with anything, not just God, these groups that try this all have conflicting beliefs. They don't even have the same gods. In fact, they all contradict each other. They're mutually exclusive. So make up whatever story you want to explain it away, but it seems so blatantly obvious that it's BS to me, that it's embarrassing. From a psychology perspective, just knowing how the human brain works. Okay. Okay, let's continue on. The first point that I just want to get out of the way here is that feelings, to a certain extent, are indeed a valid source of communication and even truth. For example, if you suddenly feel an intense pain in your gut, your body is telling you that there's something wrong. That's the truth, even if you have no other evidence to corroborate that yet. That feeling is the evidence. If it's serious enough, it could mean the difference between life and death. Okay, hang on. Are we talking about nerve endings physically sending a signal from your abdominal area to your brain? Is that what we're talking about when we say gut feeling? Because I've never mistaken stimulated nerve endings sending a pain signal to my brain for the Holy Spirit, even when I was religious. That isn't the same as the gut feeling I think he's talking about. The gut feeling I think he's talking about doesn't really involve your gut at all. It's just a thought in the back of your head eating at you. Like, maybe I shouldn't meet this person from Craigslist after all. Something might go wrong. I'd rather find a couch somewhere else. Now, if you decide not to get the couch, you'll never know if something bad would have happened. If you decide to get the couch anyways, and nothing bad happens, you just forget about it. But if you decide to get the couch, and you get in a car accident on the way there, suddenly, you're convinced your gut was right, and you should listen to it next time. There is something to the gut feeling, with some things. Scientific research has shown we can detect some things unconsciously before we detect them consciously, like snakes, for example. But that's not not the same as detecting something that's completely undetectable otherwise, in some supernatural sense. Okay, next clip. Even non-Latter-day Saint websites describe how the spirit can provide you with an inner knowing, also curiously described as a gut feeling about something. You don't just have to be a Latter-day Saint to feel that. It's available anytime anyone takes a step towards Christ. And anytime anybody takes a step toward Vishnu or Buddha or any other supernatural agent who, according to their lore, has the power to inspire a gut feeling, mysteriously, people get that gut feeling about them every single time. How about that? So who's right? Is it Muslims? Is it Hindus? Who is it? How do we tell which one is right about their gut feeling? Do you think maybe we shouldn't base our beliefs, especially beliefs that are so important, off of a feeling that everybody gets about conflicting things? Maybe we should base something so important off of something a little more concrete? The main argument against the spiritual confirmation method of learning truth is that truth should be based solely upon empirical, physical evidence. And physical evidence is great, but looking for physical evidence in regards to spiritual matters is sort of like trying to learn about apples by researching oranges. For example, how do you know the Bible is true? Many people believe it's true because of the archaeological evidence available. Many others believe it's false because of the lack of evidence. 
The same is true for the Book of Mormon. Here's the bottom line. As a Christian, as a Mormon, this guy is making truth claims. He's making claims that can be proven false. Believing that God is real in this kind of amorphous sense, where we can't prove he exists, but we can't prove he doesn't exist, is something that deeply conflicts with science. There's no way to prove it wrong. It's called unfalsifiable. To be worth anything at all to me, as a claim, it needs to be falsifiable. I have to be able to devise a test that could prove it wrong, if it were wrong. For example, here are some of the things that could falsify evolution. If it could be shown that mutations don't occur. If it could be shown that when they do occur, they aren't passed down through generations. If it could be shown that selection or environmental pressures don't favor the reproductive success of better adapted individuals. Any of this stuff would prove evolution wrong. Now what would prove that Mormons are wrong? So much it's ridiculous. I can't say what would prove Christianity wrong because as I said in my last video, Christianity is too broad of a term. We have to zero in on specific groups and address the claims they make. Let's take some claims from Mormons and point out the flaws. Claim number one is taken directly from the CES letter, page 111 under the chapter Science. The CES letter was written by Jeremy Runnels, addressed to the Mormon church to address their claims. Exactly what we're doing right now. You guys absolutely must pick this up. It's free to download online. Here's the first point under the chapter entitled Science. 2 Nephi 2.22 and Alma 12.23-24, which are books in the Book of Mormon, a lot like Matthew or Mark are in the Bible, state that there was no death of any kind on this earth until the fall of Adam, which according to DNC 77 six to seven occurred about 7,000 years ago. It is scientifically established that there's been life and death on this planet for billions of years. How does the church reconcile this? Here's another. If Adam and Eve are the first humans, how do we explain the dozen or so other hominid species who lived and died 35,000 to 2.4 million years before Adam? When did those guys stop being human? And here's a third. Genetic science and testing has advanced significantly the past few decades. I was surprised to learn from results of my own genetic test. Now, remember, this is being stated to the Mormon church by Jeremy Runnels. It says, I was surprised to learn from the results of my own genetic test that 1.6% of my DNA is Neanderthal. How does this fact fit with Mormon theology and doctrine that I am a literal descendant of a literal Adam and Eve from about 7,000 years ago? Where do the Neanderthals fit in? How do I have pre-Adamic Neanderthal DNA and Neanderthal blood circulating my veins when this species died off about 33,000 years before? for Adam and Eve. You really don't walk away from those criticisms. Those are just a few of the super basic ones. We're ignoring the fact that the Book of Mormon tells factual stories involving horses and swords and all kinds of other stuff that just did not exist at that time in that area of the world. Those are factual claims that can just completely dismantle the book. I honestly don't care what feeling I get from my gut or from reading the Book of Mormon. It's been proven to be false a hundred times over. If you wonder if that's hyperbole, then read the CES letter. That can contains more than enough proof. Okay, that's all I've got for you guys. Don't forget to support me on Patreon and Teespring. I'm sure I've harped on that enough already. I'm just pissed off at YouTube right now. Also, if you want to see my videos early, you can watch them on Facebook or Patreon as soon as I finish them. Also, also, check out my podcast where I talk about news, politics, games, all kinds of interesting stuff. All links are in the description as always. Okay, thanks for watching, guys.